everyone, welcome back to another Engines of SEPTA episode. Today we're going to talk about something a little bit different. Instead of talking about a regional rail vehicle, we're going to talk about a vehicle on the Norristown High Speed Line, or <clears throat> excuse me, Slow Speed Line as it's called now, but that's another story. Today we're going to talk about the JG Brill High Speed Car, or as everyone calls them, the Norristown Bullets. No. No. Still no. Getting close. Still- Oh for God's sake, not another one! There you go, thank you. This is the story on the Norristown Bullets. In the late 1920s and early 1930s, W.L. Butler, the vice chairman of the Philadelphia and Western, launched a broad research program for a new type of high-speed electric rail car. Butler was also responsible for the development of the famous Red Devils that served on the Cincinnati and Lake Erie, Cedar Rapids and Iowa, and the Lehigh Valley Transit Company. Unlike the Devils, however, the Bullets had an all-aluminum body, plus the Bullets bear a unique distinction as being the first American rail car in a wind tunnel. You usually see airplanes going in there. The car was incredibly streamlined to reduce air resistance, save on energy consumption, and overall the Bullets design had only two things in mind, speed and a very smooth ride. Production of the cars began in 1931 with 11 going to the Philadelphia and Western, number 201 through 211. In 1932, the Fonda, Johnstown, and Gloversville Railroad purchased five bullet cars, numbered 125 to 130. The Philadelphia and Western cars worked exclusively on third rail current, while the FJ and G cars used 600 volt overhead wires and trolley poles, as well as trolley wheels. The Philly cars measured 55 feet in length weighed 24 tons, and had four traction motors capable of over 400 horsepower. The Bullet's maximum speed was over 92 miles an hour, but one did manage to reach 100 miles per hour while testing extended wheelbase trucks. Such speeds were almost sci-fi like back in those days. The FJ and G cars on the other hand were shorter at 46 feet 11 inches, weighed 19.1 tons, and could only run a, at a maximum speed of 75 miles an hour, which was still pretty fast. The Norristown Bullet started off with Wabco AA1 horns, but over the years, as the horns became more and more scarce, they were replaced with Wabco AA2s, similar to the ones on the Silverliner 2s and 3s. Here's some samples of both. <laughs> are often considered to be the granddaddies of high-speed trains due to their streamlined casing and speed. The Japanese Udaku 3000 series SE Romance car was inspired by the casing of the bullets and in 1957 set a record of over 90.1 miles an hour, which was a new record for narrow gauge trains. The bullets are also considered to be the ancestors of many high-speed trains of today, such as the Eurostar, TGV, the ICE, the Shinkansen bullet trains, the AVE, and even the Acela Express of Amtrak. The cars are also strikingly similar to the German Flying Hamburger. Now I'm hungry. Now the Philadelphia and Western was originally a class 1 railroad to compete with the bigger railroads of the Philadelphia area at the time, such as the good old Reading Railroad of my area, and the Great Pennsylvania Railroad, the standard railroad of the world. But the railroad had laid standard gauge trackage with a trait never seen before by an interurban. No railroad crossings. It also featured a color light block signal system, which, <coughs> believe it or not, was still a rather new thing at the time. And the entire line was almost all double track to reduce and prevent head on collisions, with the only single track section between Bridgeport Station and the end of the Bridgeport Viaduct before it gets into Norristown. This has been standard on almost all forms of SEPTA rail, especially regional rail. 
If that wasn't enough to enhance the bullet's potential, the track and signal systems were heavily upgraded time after time to remit full high speed. In one test run, a bullet covered the 13.5 miles of track between Norristown and 69th Street and Upper Dump in less than 11 minutes, while in regular passenger service, they cut express timing schedules by one-third from 24 minutes to 16 minutes, including stops and speeds of over 80 to 90 miles an hour. Unfortunately, due to the Great Depression in the 1930s and the increasing number of cars piling up on America's roads, this prevented further sales of bullets to be made. However, that didn't stop these cars from making impact on SEPTA and Philadelphia history in general. The bullets, for a short amount of time, ran alongside the Lehigh Valley Red Devils on the Liberty Bell Limited line. These would run on the same tracks as the Norristown Bullets until reaching Norristown, where they got onto Main Street Station and continue on to Allentown to put some pressure on the Reading. However, in 1951, the Lehigh Valley ended service on the line, and in 1953, ended all their services. The Philadelphia and Western was then absorbed by the Philadelphia Suburban Transportation Company, or PSTC, which was more popularly known as the Red Arrow Lines. But in 1956, the PESTC abandoned the original branch between Villanova and Stratford, leaving only electric MU train service between 69th Street and Norristown as it is currently today, with part of the branch becoming the Radnor Trail. In the early 1960s, SEPTA came onto the scene and absorbed the PTSC, and assumed operation on the old Philadelphia and Western Main Line and immediately calling it the Norristown High Speed Line. And SEPTA originally considered it a trolley route, much like 101 and 102, which were also former PTSC tracks. Even though the NHSL didn't go to any streets, people simply just called it the Route 100, regardless if it was considered a trolley or not. Regardless, the Bullets managed to have a very long service life thanks to their build quality and Philadelphia and Western's excellent maintenance on both the tracks and the cars. The Bullets were also well liked by operators and riders. One former Bullet driver once said, you could fill up a full glass of red wine in a martini glass, put it on the dashboard, and that thing ain't going to spill a drop at all throughout the journey. So when you reached your destination, be it either Norristown or 69th Street, you could have a nice glass of deserved red wine. Pretty cool, huh? Other transit vehicles, of course, came and went on the Norristown High Speed Line, such as the Red Arrows and the CTAs, but the bullets outlasted them all. But of course, there's one thing no piece of rolling stock can avoid, age. Despite the rather reliable bullets, they were reaching over 60 years in service, and soon, problems arose in expensive high maintenance, failing reliability, electrical issues, and the lack of spare parts being available for the cars. In the early 1980s, SEPTA officials decided that a modernization of the NHSL fleet was necessary, as well as other things such as track upgrades and signal upgrades. The new cars in question would cost $55 million, be the fifth piece of equipment acquired for the NHSL, and the largest car body the NHSL has ever seen. This would eventually be known as the ABB N5s. Unfortunately, fabrication of the first cars progressed slowly. Prototype 451 was lowered for testing in Beach Grove, and when this was announced, delivery was thought to be imminent soon, but numerous tests had not been passed yet. So like the Silverliner 2s and 3s, these problems kept the bullets on for another few years. Thankfully without a fire though. 451 eventually passed its tests by 1993, and soon delivery finally began on the new cars that were already a few years late. SEPTA however wasn't happy about the cars being delivered late. <laughs> So SEPTA sued ABB Traction for punitive damages. The case was eventually resolved between two companies with numerous fines being paid. And in return, ABB Traction lended SEPTA an ALP44M number 2308, 
which became part of the Push-Pull Fleet for SEPTA's Regional Rail Division. The last run of the Bullets took place in August 1990, with cars 206 and 209 running back and forth between the line on a special excursion. Shortly thereafter, the Bullet cars were eventually retired, but thankfully a lot of them have been preserved. 203, 207, and 208 are at the Seashore Trolley Museum in Ken Funkport, Maine. 204's body was sent to the National Museum of Transportation in St. Louis, Missouri. 205 is at the Rock Hill Trolley Museum and operates on occasion being modified with a trolley pole. 206 is at the Rock Hill Trolley Museum in Scranton, just a short distance away from Big Boy 4012, with the size comparison being like a caterpillar next to a lion. 209 is at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum in Washington, PA. As for the FJ&G cars, 125 is owned by the Utah State Railroad Museum, with 126 soon to be reserved by the same museum. 127 is at the Orange Empire Railroad Museum in Paris, California. And 128 is at the Art City Trolley Restaurant in Springville, Utah, but is barely recognizable as a bullet anymore. The rest have been presumed scrapped. The Bullets are likely a candidate for the longest serving rail car in the whole United States. They even lasted longer than the GG1s, which ran from the 1930s to 1983. They will always be remembered in the history of the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transit Authority, serving the Philadelphia area since 1963. While the Bullets may now be a faded memory out of everyone's minds, they will always be remembered long service, comfortable ride, and high speed. Well, that's about it for this video. Thank you so much for sticking through this whole thing. I know it ended up being pretty long because of how much history was behind these cars, but eh, who could resist, right? So, next time we'll be talking about the replacements for the bullets, the ABB M5s. Stay tuned, and I'll see you in the next video. So, until next time, all aboard!